those awkward moments of silence. While everyone's coming in. Hello, everyone. We start in just a few minutes. How come my computer is not working? And I, I think, um, hi everyone and welcome. Um, I wanted to say, feel free to, to start sharing um, who you are and why you're joining in the chat. While we're waiting for everyone to join, we'll be starting very shortly. Right, uh, we have a few people to admit to this event and then I guess we can start. Wonderful, these things, it gives home invasion a totally new meaning. <laughs> <laughs> I can see your homes. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, definitely feels cozy. All right. I think that this is a new habit we will adopt and will not let go. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, look at that. We have people joining us from way outside the boundaries of the GTA. So <laughs> we have US, Canada, Cincinnati. <laughs> India, China, Texas. Who's from Texas? Yeah, I'd say we have people today from all over the world. Not only that, but also we got a record number of people ever joined MNG. So congratulations. We're all celebrating a big hit today. Uh, hello, everyone. I think uh, we can slowly start. Um, and we're going to spend a few first minutes for the introduction. So we'll let people uh, in while we speak. Uh, it's very nice to see you all. Uh, all the new faces and all the old friends. Uh, for all the new people, my name is Maxim. I'm director of membership in the AMA. I co-host the event today together with Marina uh, Bulatova and Leah Greenberg. If you have any organizational questions, feel free to reach out to them or to me in chat. Uh, we will be happy to answer them. Please make sure your microphones are on mute and your cameras are off for the presentation part. As I said, we are, we are planning to have almost 150 people and um, using cameras might, be, might disrupt the quality of our session. So please turn, on, turn off your cameras and uh, turn them on when you will be having um, breakout sessions or you, when you will be asking questions. That's the only thing. That's, I would say, the only rule that we have here today. Uh, now please allow me to present Leah Greenberg, uh, our Vice President of Membership of the American Marketing Association. Leah, our virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. I'm so glad uh, to see everybody here. Some new faces, some familiar faces, and I'm, so, I'm seeing all the notes uh, of everybody joining from different parts of the world. And if you're joining us from a different time zone, thank you so much for joining. I really, really am happy that you're here. Uh, for those of you that are uh, usually come to our uh, marketing networking groups, welcome again. Uh, if this is your first one, welcome for the first time. Uh, for those of you that are attending for the first time, this is a monthly event that the uh, membership team, so my team from the AMA hosts, uh, and uh, Max and Marina are, uh, seek the best speakers and uh, present, to present to you and share their knowledge. 
Uh, what we want to, this is a networking session, so uh, we have uh, an amazing speaker that uh, Miglena is going to introduce. But after the, uh, after the speaker, uh, we have a really wonderful Q&A session uh, lined up. And then this is a networking event, so it's up to you to meet. Uh, we're going to be uh, broken out into breakout groups, and it's up to you to uh, introduce yourselves, to meet uh, your fellow marketers, uh, and make hopefully new connections. Uh, with, with everybody in, in, your, in your group, and we'll pro hopefully have at least one or two of them, time permitting. Uh, and then uh, speaking of membership, uh, it's, uh, for those of you that are members, I'm, I'm really happy to, to see everybody. For those of you who are not, uh, I asked this last time, which is what are you waiting for? There's never been a better time to join. Uh, we have a new uh, price of membership uh, for, for those of you that are not familiar. It's 149 dollars and uh, these uh, marketing networking groups are free for all members plus we have an ama amazing other suite of benefits uh, for our members uh, which include uh, discounted attendance to other uh, other live events and a whole host of other benefits so please check out our web page uh, we also have an amazing new price for students as well uh, for those of you that have just recently graduated or are about to graduate um, so reach out to myself, uh, reach out to Max, reach out to Marina. I'm not sure if there are any other members of my team that are here. Uh, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer any questions about membership, about uh, MNGs, about events, anything you really, really want to know. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I, I'm really happy to be hosting the session uh, for you today. And uh, Miglena, our president, is, has a couple of words to say to introduce our, our amazing speaker today. Miglena, over to you. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, it is really my pleasure. I could not give that away uh, to, to anyone else because uh, I met Rick uh, two years ago at Leadership Summit in Chicago, and I knew that he was someone special. I, I was uh, really excited by the energy he brought, uh, the inspiration he brought, and uh, I really wanted to introduce him. So. Uh, in most circles of the AMA, uh, he needs no introduction. Uh, and some of you may remember, he joined our CMO panel uh, earlier in June. So Rick Sweeney is an associate professor of marketing at the University of Cincinnati's uh, Carl Linder College of Business, uh, where he serves as faculty advisor for the UC AMA, Catalyst Marketing, Sigma Phi Epsilon Fraternity, and Project HEAL. As a devoted AMA volunteer, both locally and nationally since 1996, Rick has been a game changer in the marketing landscape and the organization's development. He has served in various capacities, uh, including also the AMA's board of directors for seven years. Um, and Rick is currently a chair elect of the AMA Foundation Board of Advisors. His impact on marketing just within the AMA um, can be captured um, in the fact that the annual um, AMA Volunteer Award of the Year carries his name. Um, and um, um, in 2018, Rick was named a Cincinnati marketing legend. So we have a pleasure of having a, a real legend uh, among us. And um, um, I have no doubt Rick will inspire you just uh, the way he inspired me when I first met him. So uh, Rick, take it away. Uh, that's uh, thank you so much, Miglena. That's very kind of you. I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate that uh, that we were able to reconnect after a year and 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 uh, ultimately um, bring me here at least virtually. I so wish that I could be up there in Toronto. I know we all wish that we could be in the same room together. Um, this has been a crazy time. It's affected each of us uh, personally, of course. It's affected all of our businesses um, in ways that we never imagined, of course. And uh, so I, I think this topic is very relevant right now as we, as we think about how it affects everyone. As Miglena said, I, I teach at University of Cincinnati and, and coming into this session at 4.30 this afternoon, I got an email from a student saying that they had been exposed to coronavirus. Now, luckily we we're having virtual sessions. So I uh, do not know who this student is other than knowing her name, but, but still you see where it just affects everyone so much. And it's, uh, so, so this topic of personal branding, I think is something that is something uh, that we really should uh, talk about and explore. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I hope I do this the right way. I've been working with about seven different programs. 
And so I'm going to go ahead and share what I have. And so hopefully you all can see everything. If you can't, um, let Max or Miglena or, or Marina know, and they'll certainly tell me if uh, we need to see something else. But um, uh, let's go ahead and get started. You know, as I, as I talk about this topic, it's one that's been really interesting to me just because as I started thinking through my own career and what I've been going through over years and years, I've tried to discover some things about myself. And so in addition to what Miglena told you about myself, um, here's just a little bit about me. Yes, I am a member of Sigma Phi Epsilon fraternity where I'm a faculty fellow and really enjoy working with the brothers on a national and regional and local level. With that, um, I have been a member of the AMA and love the AMA and continue to love the AMA. That's why I stay involved with them. And yes, I do uh, teach at the University of Cincinnati and really enjoy doing that. But a couple of things uh, additionally about me, I uh, love coffee. So I love Starbucks or anywhere else, um, sometimes too much. And uh, I also love good food, I love uh, good, uh, good, um, good wine, of course, and, and drinks. And uh, since I love that, I need to exercise. It might not be something I love doing, but it's something I need to do uh, a lot. Um, I like to study, uh, still trying to constantly learn things and do things. So I constantly like to study. Um, I'm trying to learn French. I'll tell you more about that in a second. And also love traveling, not able to travel as much right now, which is kind of killing me, but that's okay. Um, I also love interior design, landscape design. I love fashion. All of those things I tell you about because they kind of make me what I am. And that's really what we want to do today is we want to talk about who we are and talk about how we can uh, develop this roadmap to a powerful personal brand. And one of the questions that Max forwarded to me is, do I have any recommendations of people who I feel are powerful personal brands? And I've just got six up here and the list could be longer. And I know we all have those, those people who we feel the brands are something important to them, but going through just a few of them, you know, we, we've got Lady Gaga. I mean, here she is this incredible talent, classically trained. And, but if you look beyond that outrageous exterior that she sometimes had, especially in the past, you see someone who's very insightful and very caring and very thoughtful about everything she does. And I think that adds a great deal to her personal brand. Um, LeBron James, great basketball player, but also this humanitarian, someone who cares about where he came from and is constantly trying to give back to schools and to people so that they can have a good life. And so he does that knowing where he came from himself. I couldn't do this list without Oprah. Entrepreneur, someone who has a very strong brand, whether it's her TV show that she had or her network or her book club or any of the things she does for colleges and universities and students to give them an opportunity. She's got one of those brands where in her case, she only needs you know, one name in order to be recognized. Um, I couldn't do this without adding in a Canadian. So Ryan Reynolds is someone who I think has a really strong brand. Ryan Reynolds himself, um, you know, kind of irreverent, kind of quirky, good actor, but he stands out in terms of his brand just based on kind of how he acts and how he interacts. If you watch anything on YouTube, which I watch way too much, you'll see him interacting in different ways, whether it's things that he does uh, with his, his love-hate relationship with Hugh Jackman or anything else that might be out there. It's kind of fun to watch what he does, but a very strong brand. Martha Stewart, yes, you know, so many people can bake a pie or a cake or do gardening, but she does it with this uh, kind of thoughtfulness of what has happened. She's someone who built a personal brand had it torn down through some legal issues, but has built it back up. And again, I couldn't uh, do this without maybe a little bit of a political nod there. And so we have Michelle Obama. She's not just the wife of Barack Obama. She's not just a first lady. She really has developed her own brand and what she stands for in terms of caring, in terms of compassion. Um, I wanna share with you a couple of other people and I won't give the story away, but it is Stefan, Jade, Merritt and Luke. Um, for people who are actually building a personal brand, remember those names because I'm going, going to come back to them. And so the question we have is really, you know, how do we build a powerful personal brand? 
And you'll see a lot of websites. There's also a question out there about, you know, what kind of resources do you uh, recommend for building a personal brand? And there are a lot of them out there. And you're going to see a lot of resources out there that really talk about how you promote yourself, what you do in terms of uh, setting yourself apart through your promotion aspect. And that certainly is a big part of it. But for me, really uh, de uh, developing a powerful personal brand and how you build that is through three steps. And they're actually simple steps. They take some time, but they're actually simple steps. Those three steps are discover, develop, deliver. A lot of sites out there, a lot of people really focus on that third part of how you deliver or how you promote who you are. And we can certainly talk about that. But what I want to focus on today really is discover and develop. Because as another question out there uh, that Max forwarded to me, uh, it said, um, um, is it commonly misunderstood? And I think that personal branding might be misunderstood because we don't focus on discover and develop enough. I think they're underrated. I think they're, they're underrepresented in terms of how we go out and use them and utilize them. So I wanna spend a little bit more time on those today. And then we can certainly talk about deliver, especially if you have questions related to that itself. So as we dig into discover, develop and deliver, let's start out with discover. Now discovery is one of those things that we're doing on a constant basis. We're discovering things about ourselves, what our strengths and weaknesses are, where we're figuring out what we're good at and maybe not so good at, we're constantly starting to discover what other people think of us. You know, one of those things that I have people do when they go through this exercise during a seminar is I actually have them go out and ask people for their impressions of them. And it's a, even a checklist of, you know, positive traits or potentially negative traits that we all have. So you kind of rate yourself. And then I've done this with students where they've come back and said, I asked my boss, I asked one of my professors, and I asked my girlfriend in this case. And you know, they all kind of said these things that I didn't realize about myself. And so when you go through this discovery phase, you get to start to understand not only from your own perspective, but from the perspectives of others, what they think of you. I have people go out and analyze your public profile. You've probably all maybe done it once or twice, but if you do a Google search on your name, what does it pull up? You know, for me, fortunately, it pulls up some of my AMA volunteerism. It pulls up my work at the University of Cincinnati and a couple of things with Sigma Phi Epsilon that I'm involved in. So it tends to pull those up. But I had a student who uh, ended up being one of my teaching assistants and I knew him from his freshman year. And I couldn't remember how to spell his last name because it was a, it's, a, it's a long Italian name. And so I was trying different uh, spellings in Google and everything. And what popped up was his arrest record. And so that kind of popped up first thing out there. And so what I realized uh, was, and then you know, I sent him a little message and it, it, was, it was a minor thing, but regardless, that was the second thing that showed up under his profile. And you think, wow, I don't think we want that to happen. So what happens in terms of your brand if you Google yourself or if you go out to your public profile, even if it's Facebook or Instagram, what kind of pictures are out there that might be showing you in a different light than people have? Um, this whole topic of recognizing your values, thinking about what's important to you. Now, I, you know, I have values such as honesty and respect and hard work and caring and compassion. Not everyone shares those. Some people might say that they share those same values, not necessarily. And so you try to recognize what your values are and what is important to you. You know, at the end of the day, I really value work-life balance. So I'm not one of those people who's going to work until one o'clock in the morning every night. That's just not my nature. I want time to relax. I need time to relax. Now, some people say, you know, they don't have that as a value as much and that's okay. But when you start to think about who you are and how you want to live your life, you start to learn more about then what you want to be and what you want to do. Um, investigating what makes you unique. Again, you know, what makes me unique? I kind of showed it on those slides prior. In terms of my involvement with the AMA, 
and my involvement with my fraternity, the things that I like to do make me different from other members of the AMA, make me different from other faculty members at UC because I didn't come through a traditional way of, of you know, going to college, getting my PhD, going to a university and teaching. I started out as a practitioner doing marketing and eventually made my way over to academia. It just makes me a little bit more unique, which I think adds to, adds to what I am and what I bring to the university. Discovering your passions. You know, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What kind of things really, truly, truly excite you about life? And all of these things together ultimately allow you to determine what your goals are. So you think about what your values are, you think about what you're good at and what you're strong at, and maybe that is something outside your business. So, you know, within business, I think I'm pretty organized. I think I can manage projects well. I think I'm a good communicator. So those might be the things that I'm pretty good at. Now I have my downside too, uh, in terms of, you know, I'm, I maybe don't like to interact with people as much. Um, I tend to be more awkward, shy, and introverted. And so that's one of those things that other people don't share. But what are your strengths and what does make you very unique? I had a student a couple of years ago who, he was 21 at the time, so this was okay. And he said he really liked wine and he wanted to learn more about wine. I said, learn more about wine. And now probably about 10 years later, he's doing marketing for a wine company. So something that he loves doing, and he figured out a way to incorporate that into what he is. In fact, while we're talking about wine, most of us and like to enjoy a glass of wine every now and then. And so let me tell you about a wine company, because this is an interesting thing about this wine com company. Their name is Frequency Wines, and you probably haven't heard of them. They are a winery that is in the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia. If you've never been there, get there at some point because it's a beautiful area. It stretches from, I guess, uh, maybe as far north as Vernon, but Ver uh, de definitely Kelowna down to Osoyoos. And it's just beautiful country. And it's got all of these wineries. It's a great area for growing a variety of wines. And the British Columbia Wine Authority is making sure that they're growing quality wines out there. Well, Frequency Wines isn't even on this map. In fact, there are a lot of people who are probably going to say that Frequency is not the best winery out there. But what makes them different is that they say Frequency is a place for artists to create positive vibrations that are infused into the wines. Frequency is the wine and sound experience. So as you start to learn about Frequency, what you learn is the story of Frequency Wine itself. And the story of Frequency Wine is pretty cool. There are actually a couple of musicians. And so these musicians, they got together and they also liked to make wine. So let's open a winery. Sure, let's do that. And one day where the wine was storing and everything, they started to, their, their band kind of set up shop and they were playing some music and everything. And they did that for weeks upon weeks. And then at one point they decided, hey, while we're playing music, we may as well drink some wine. What they discovered was that the wine barrels nearest the drum set tasted better, in their opinion. Now, that's kind of random and weird, you might think. But then what they've done with that is they realized, A, combining their, their passions, which is winemaking and music, but also what makes them unique as a winery is, as this says, watching a sound frequency transform a pile of sand into a symmetrical shape is humbling. Tasting what it does to wine is straight up unbelievable. Their wine's been exposed to the frequency 528. And so what the frequency 528 is, I had to look this up because I didn't know, is the DNA repair frequency, which is used by scientists. And so what they do is they expose their wine to this very high frequency. And then they say what it does is it settles some bad things, some of the sediments perhaps, in the wine itself and makes the wine clearer and better tasting. That's their opinion. I'm sure a million people have a million different opinions, but the cool thing about this frequency is it's called the love frequency. It's the miracle note of the solfeggio scale. So they're calling it the, the, the bioenergy of health and longevity. 
That's a really unique positioning for a company. Now, if I were going back to the Okanagan Valley, and I'd love to sometime soon, I would definitely check out Frequency Wine because of the way that they're positioned, because of the way that they seem unique. Maybe they're not the best wine, I'm not a great judge of wine, but they certainly are a unique brand out there. And so you think about what makes you unique and what your goals are both in the short term and long term. That might be to get a promotion. It might be to uh, learn a new language. It might be to run a marathon. It might be to get into a new relationship and ultimately get married and all of those things. We all have long-term goals. We also have short-term goals. And I go through all of this because I think it's important for us to go through this discovery and not just do it once, but continually go through all of this discovery that we have because that takes us to the development phase. Now that we know kind of who we are, we're given the opportunity to develop this roadmap. And so what I've got here are really three fairly simple questions, but it takes time to fill them out. In fact, I have a worksheet and I'm going to get that to the team so that they can send it out to anyone who's interested and anyone who attends. A simple worksheet that's kind of based right off of this. Pretty easy to do because one, it's what is your goal? Well, you've just set what some of your goals are in the short term and long term. What do you need in order to accomplish that goal? So do you need additional skills, knowledge, experience, et cetera? And then finally, what's your time frame? So you need to set some kind of time frame that goes along with your goal. When do you uh, think you're going to achieve it? What are your milestones? What are your check-in points? What are your celebration points for reaching certain milestones? So I'll give you an example. A couple years ago, I decided that I wanted to become fluent in French. It was probably like three, four or five years ago that I actually said this. But a couple years ago, I thought, I'm, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to get fluent in French. How much French do I know? None. Can I look at a menu and maybe order something? Yes. Do I know maybe some basic, basic French words and phrases? Yes. But I don't know the French language. So my goal was to, in the long term, become fluent in French. Well, I had to break that down. And I had to break that down into, I can't just study for a month and become fluid. And so with French and as with most languages, you have A level, B level, C level. I was at an A1, if then, when I started out. And so I know that I needed to accomplish a variety of things in order to reach that goal. What did I need to do? Well, I needed whatever it might take in terms of um, books, um, digital files, audio files, podcasts, in order to start to study what French is all about. I made the decision to actually go over to Paris and study there for a month so I could understand French and learn a little bit more. I realized that I need the motivation. I need the continued drive. I need the determination so I don't just get disgusted and throw it all away one day. And so I also needed the commitment. All of those things that you think, okay, what do you need in order to accomplish this? Because if you don't write it down, you're going to forget about it. It's never going to happen. And then what's the time frame? Well, when I started out, and especially last year and maybe into uh, early 2019, I was at an A1 level. I thought I could improve from there by the time I got to Paris in the summer and get to an A2 level. I didn't. So my time frame had to change a little bit because, hey, I thought it would take me maybe a year to get fluent. I was totally wrong. It was unreasonable. It wasn't a realistic goal at all. And so you think about those little milestones that you hit. I was A1. I think at this point, if I did a test, I'm probably at A2, but I'm certainly not at B1, B2, C1, C2. So I'm not fluent yet. So I've had to change my timeframes a little bit. But was I able to celebrate a couple of things along the way? Yes, when I passed my first test, I was feeling good about that. When I completed my studies in Paris, that made me feel good, gave me something to do. And I think that's what we need to do is develop this roadmap that looks like, you know, what do you want to do? If you want to run a marathon, what do you need? Well, you, uh, you can't run a marathon tomorrow if you've never run before. So you need shoes, you need training, you need to ramp up, you need to do different types of things in order to do that. And you need to set your time frame. I want to run a marathon next spring or whenever that might be. 
but how do you celebrate those little milestones? Today I ran 10 miles and I felt good, or I did my first 5K and I felt good. You start to think about what kind of different milestones you need along that, knowing that if I start at the lower left-hand corner where the, uh, the yellow and purple uh, button is and you go up to the blue and green button, you can make that progress along that roadmap. We'll come back to this um, in a second, especially as we talk about delivery, because um, real quick, and then of course I wanna spend time to answer any kind of questions that you all have about this. When you deliver, this is where you create and refine your online persona. This is where you start to look at what your online persona might actually be. This is where you network, very importantly, and even though we think that this pandemic has made it more difficult for us to do a lot of these things, it actually gives us an opportunity to deliver on our personal brand in new and different ways. Ways that aren't going away because the way we're living our lives is probably changing a lot more. This next thing, let someone else do the bragging for you. I appreciate that Miglena did a little bragging for me, so thank you again for that. Um, but you think about what happens in terms of recommendations on LinkedIn. You think about what happens when someone else can do some posting on your behalf, talking about what you're doing. And those things are important because they can be part of your brand. Yes, there are those people out there in the world who prefer to the, do the bragging for themselves, that might work in some circles, but not everyone really buys into that in the same way. And then we will talk about how we need to also anticipate change, and I'll talk about that in a second. But when we think about what you do in terms of your online persona, there was also someone who asked a question about the influence of a personal podcast and whether that can be something that's relevant and something that's good. Um, there are, compared to perhaps a YouTube channel uh, that's out there, there are tons of YouTube influencers or people who would like to consider themselves to be YouTube influencers. Anyone with a camera can be on YouTube and you can show a variety of things that you're doing. And there are a lot of people out there. Now, some of them might be somewhat influential, but I think a lot of them are just popular or they become a celebrity because of something that they're doing. Um, I don't find YouTube, I, I find it very entertaining and I watch way too much of it, but I don't necessarily find um, YouTube to be perhaps the best way of promoting ourselves. Um, I think you can in the appropriate situations, but I think websites and I think podcasts are also a great way of doing that if you have something unique to say. I don't have much time to listen to a lot of different podcasts and there are a ton out there about how you can, you know, be a better person, how you can be stronger, different things that are very motivational out there. Um, I have some students at the University of uh, Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky, just uh, south of the river, uh, a couple of hours from me, um, who are in the same fraternity, who have their own podcast. Sadly, I'm not even taking time to listen to those because the podcast I listen to is um, Coffee Break French. It's the only one I listen to because I'm trying to expand on my French learning. You know, if I'm not doing that, I'll, I'll listen to a variety of things. I, on National Public Radio, we have Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which I really enjoy, and, uh, and listen to something like that. But listening to these other podcasts, if you have something unique and if you can fill a space that's not out there, I think that's very relevant. YouTube's the same way. If you can do something on YouTube that is going to get a following, that's going to be something that's very unique, that's good. Just make sure you're not putting out the exact same content that everyone else is. You know, when this pandemic hit, all the gyms closed. So what some people started doing was put, going out on YouTube and doing their home workouts, whether it's yoga or whether it's, you know, weightless type of uh, exercise or if it's just stretching or anything like that. There are so many of them out there, it's hard to distinguish one from another. So unless there's something special about what you're doing, um, you, you, need to, um, you need to kind of blend in and let someone else maybe, maybe do everything there. One thing that Frequency did, they ended up on a show called Restaurants on the Edge. And that's actually how I found out about them. They were on this show where you take a restaurant that is on the edge. In other words, it's not doing well. And this happened to be um, one, I guess it was in Okanagan. I think it was maybe in Kelowna. 
um, that wasn't doing well. And what they did was they then did this partnership, if you will, with Frequency Wine and, uh, wine and Song. Um, so what they ended up doing was then kind of promoting them through something else. They let this TV show by, by promoting them brag on them a little bit and it's expanded their reach. I wouldn't have known about them otherwise. And again, if I'm in BC and in the Okanagan Valley, I'm gonna check them out and I'm gonna go there. So you think about what you do there. And then I go back to this. We've got our worksheet that has what's your goal, what do you need to accomplish your goal, and what's your time frame for reaching that goal. I wanna add one more thing in there because it's the one thing that we usually don't put in because we think if we've got this, uh, this whole development of a roadmap, everything's gonna go great. The thing I wanna add is what roadblocks should you anticipate? So there's always going to be some sort of a roadblock out there. For me, French is hard. I have a hard time learning it, understanding that. In hindsight, should I have picked another language? Maybe, but I'm sticking with French. But I'm finding that a roadblock is that it's very difficult language for me to learn. So I'm hitting roadblocks. I'm hitting points where I just can't remember anything else or I just learned something and I forget it. Those things aren't taking me in that easy trajectory from one place to the next. It's making me bounce around, not like this, but like this. And so we're going to find that in a lot of the different things that we do. We're going to find that there are these roadblocks. If you're trying to learn to run a marathon and that marathon is in that upper right-hand corner with the, the red and purple, um, you know, maybe you're going to um, have an injury. Maybe it's going to be one of those blue and green dots that have suddenly fallen down. Maybe there's going to be some kind of a problem that you just can't run fast enough. It could be a variety of things. For me in French, it was maybe my understanding and I hit some roadblocks when it came to that. You know, it's what you do after those roadblocks uh, happen that are going to kind of ultimately make you the better personal brand. Now this I happen to also use when I talk about my career. My career was not getting out of college, getting a great job, getting into marketing, and then teaching at a university. I got a job which I then kind of uh, lost and then I lost another job and then I did move um, down to Tennessee for a while. I got a couple of good things and really got into marketing. I came up to Cincinnati, I got a job, I got laid off from that job. I went back to school. That's the, uh, the, the purple and yellow dot there kind of in the center of the screen. And that allowed me then to get involved with a couple of things, you know, the AMA certainly one of those things that led me on this trajectory and ultimately to a good career, I think, at the University of Cincinnati and my involvement with AMA, that got me involved with SIGEP. And so you think about how the roadblocks can actually be a very positive catalyst for change. We all hate it if we get fired. We hate it if something bad happens, um, whether it's an injury or whatever it might be. But you think about that in a positive sense and think about that in a positive way of then delivering on a personal brand ultimately and persevering through all of that, which is really gonna make you unique. And I put this slide up here just because you can kind of see that it's a cyclical nature. We're constantly learning more about ourselves and we're doing that and we're developing maybe new and different goals. And as we develop those different goals, we get to deliver on those. You never know what might be discovered either within yourself or someone might discover about you that might lead you in a new path. And that's something to always, always be aware of. So I told you earlier about uh, some of my friends. I don't actually know these people. Stephen Hughes, Jade Davis, Merritt Williams, and Luke McCall. Uh, Stephen, Jade, Merritt, and Luke uh, are all um, musical theater performers in the West End in London. So their London is the West End, New York is Broadway. So they, they perform in the West End and they're all in a bunch of musicals. Well, what happened with the pandemic? Roadblock, out of work. They can wait tables if a restaurant is open, but what else can they do? Well, what's interesting about them and a few of their friends is they decided we still have talent, we still have passion. And we also care about performing for others. And we care also about helping others. 
So what did they do? Well, they created this group called the Welsh Singers of the West End. If you haven't seen them on YouTube, go out as soon as you leave the networking session and watch it. You'll be watching it all night long. What they do with Let It Go from Frozen, what they do with, uh, um, I forget the other one from The Greatest Show, from now on, from The Greatest Show. It's just brilliant and beautiful. They have beautiful voices and they do a lot of these different things to support the National Health Services of Wales. So here you have these people with talent who hit a roadblock, who are now then redefining who they are and what they are. And yes, they're doing it out on YouTube, but they're doing something that few other groups of people can do in the same way. So if I were a producer in the West End or, or on Broadway or anywhere, and I saw these, I would have this group of here, we have 10 of them along with some musicians who I would probably hire in a heartbeat. So that makes them stand out. It gives them this brand that, hey, I'm not just Luke McCall and I sing and do some theater stuff. I'm Luke McCall with this incredible voice and I happen to be part of the Welsh Singers of the West End. And people recognize you that way because I knew none of them prior to this. And now I feel like they're my friends when I watch their videos over and over and over again. So you think about all these different things in terms of discovery, develop and deliver, have just a few closing things that I wanna say, and then we're certainly going to open it up to any type of Q and A. One is be authentic, just, just be yourself. Don't try to be something that you're not because it's going to come off as disingenuous. So just be yourself no matter what and discover who yourself is. Um, I had someone at the AMA years ago tell me to earn my worth every single day. Every day I go into the classroom, I'm nervous, whether it's virtual or in person. And that's because I want to make sure I'm constantly delivering what I can deliver. So earn it every single day. And it's gotten me a lot of opportunities by actually doing that. Um, learn from your mistakes. Go ahead and fail. I failed countless, countless times. And so the more that you have a mistake, you can learn from it. And yes, you're gonna go home and you're gonna hate yourself for a couple minutes because you made a terrible mistake. Go ahead and learn from it and then uh, go on from there. Never fear serendipity. The way I got my job at the University of Cincinnati was all through serendipity. The way that I got on the board of the AMA was all through serendipity. All these things, or as the dean of my college likes to call it, planned luck. So you're planning, but there's this luck factor that's going on. Serendipity can be a wonderful thing. So go ahead and think about those things that just sort of happen. Um, and that's where I say, say yes. I got into marketing and I got into different things by simply by saying yes. And then the converse is also true, say no. By saying no, it doesn't mean that you're rejecting people. It's just saying that it doesn't fit for what you have the bandwidth for or the capacity for or anything else. And so it's okay to say, no, I'm not the right person for that. No, I don't have the time to do that right now, but keep me in mind for something future. And most importantly, as we go through all of this, let's all just breathe. Let's just take a couple of deep breaths and relax because we are all going to get through all of this together. And by breathing, you're going to give yourself a chance to stop panicking or you're going to give yourself a chance to, to focus on some things. So that's what I have right now. Oh, the last thing, sorry, one more thing. <laughs> um, someone asked about different resources that are out there. When I look at resources, you'll find a million of them out there. You know, um, uh, and, and I wrote a couple of them down. Dan Schauble is a good personal branding guy. Um, there, there are a couple of things, influencer marketing, um, has some things on personal branding. And there are a lot of different people who talk about personal branding. Again, they tend to talk about um, the delivery aspect more than discover and develop. So what I like to look for is things that inspire me to think differently, to, to consider opportunities and ways of doing something differently. So if you think about uh, companies like Amazon and you think about Bezos and what he's done out there. If you think about Uber and how it took a need in the marketplace and kind of changed things or how Elon Musk, like him or hate him, you know, with Tesla, what he's doing to change automobiles or Zuckerberg and Facebook. But I also have a couple of people down here at the bottom. In the center, you have Masterclass. 
I really get inspired by listening to Masterclass, you know, whether it's uh, Massimo Bottura, uh, who has um, a study of Francescana in, in Modena, Italy, incredible restaurant, or whether it's uh, Kelly Wurstler, who's a designer, or whether it's um, RuPaul, or whether it's, wow, I'm trying to think of um, uh, Misty Copeland, who's an incredible uh, principal ballerina with American Ballet Theater. All of these different people, Serena Williams is out there, um, Robin Roberts, I mean, it, it, the list goes on. What they do is, yes, they're talking about skills and skills you can apply through a master class. It's usually 10, 15 episodes, but then also what they're doing is they're inspiring you to think differently, to think more creatively. You know, Oprah, just inspiring. Um, and on, on the right, if you don't uh, know him, Lin-Manuel Miranda. So you think about a very, very long book called, you know, Hamilton, about Hamilton, um, Alexander Hamilton, and how he took that and decided that since hip hop and rap are kind of his style, he would make it into this musical. Many of you have probably seen it. If you haven't seen it, see it at some point, um, just because of, of what it does and how it inspires you to think differently about how you might do something differently. It's not just the stories of these people, but it's how they operate and how they think that tends to really inspire me. And I tend to get more out of these than I would than going to a website where someone's just talking about something. So it's important to kind of find your own inspiration in order to develop what your brand is. Now, I think at this point, I'm definitely stopping. I thank you for your time and happy to answer any kind of questions you might have. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen if that's good with you all. And that way we can kind of see anyone who's asking. But again, thank you for your time. Let's ask some questions and have a conversation. Thank you very much, Rick. That was a very insightful presentation. Uh, to moderate Q today's Q&A session, we invited Alan Middleton, a junior professor of marketing at the Schulich School of Business, and until this month, the director of the Schulich Executive Education Center, which has been a long time partner of the AMA. Alan is also a member of the Canadian Marketing Hall of Legends and an expert uh, in personal branding. Alan, welcome. Thank you very much, and a uh, big thank you to Rick. So uh, I have uh, three tasks today couple of uh, remarks and then the most important task is uh, engage him in a bit of a question and then introduce two star guests um, who I'll do in a minute both Victoria and Peter um, but a little bit so I really want to emphasize how great I think the emphasis Rick put on the three D's because we put far too much uh, emphasis on deliver and not enough on discover and develop so that's why it's called branding, because great brands come from that basis as well. So just add a couple of thoughts on that. Um, when you're on, on your discover mode, don't stop at the obvious things that you've always believed in every tell, the five to six things that you think about yourself. Dig deeper. There's research out of Europe that says, if we dig down and do a love and hate list, don't stop at the first five or 10, go to 25. Because what you'll find in the lower ranks is you ask people and you get people to contribute and say, gee, you're really good at this, Rick. You go, oh, am I? I, I didn't really know that. And you may find better patterns by going deeper for you know, what are the strengths and also what you don't like, what you, what you so to stay away from. So. First thing, go deep. Second thing, ask your friends. You know, get them to be moderately honest. Don't just do it yourself. Get the, get them in saying, you know, gee, well, you know, uh, Alan, God, you didn't handle that very well. And gee, gee, why did you leave advertising in the first place? You know, so you get that kind of conversation going. Um, absolutely learn, totally agree with Rick. I'm going to agree with everything he said, not just because he's on, because I think he's dead right. Um, but, you know, d d get in there when you, when you looked at what have you failed at and don't regard failure as what is it about what you did that didn't work? Because that's an insight into knowing yourself and that element becomes really critical. And my last general point about the three D's is especially in the post COVID world, and I hope there is a post in the COVID world. 
think of yourselves as total human beings. We, we've had a tradition of separating work and home life, partly because we traveled to work away from home a lot of the time. Think about what you've experienced in the last six months as you see people's family walk across the back of the screen or the pets come in front and all of a sudden, and as I mentioned very early on, I can see your homes in front of you. Think of yourself these days. We've got to break down these silos, not only inside organizations, but across organizations. One of the themes of the COVID world is where it's worked, government, not-for-profits, commercial enterprise, and different groups are learning to work together better. We've got to sustain that for the future, but apply it to yourselves so you don't have silos in the way of thinking. This is what I'm like at marketing. This is what I'm like when I'm doing pleasure. This is what I'm like when I'm with my family, because you'll find huge interlinkages that can be developed. I'd love to know what it is in Rick's background that led him into French, but, but I, I, I won't ask him that question. So that, that's my, my, my quick comment. So I'm gonna bung Rick one question and then introduce uh, Victoria and uh, also Peter, um, which is, Rick, as you've been putting this together and in your studies, what have you found is the, the major blockage? You said you're, part of what you've got to do is overcome blockages. What is the major blockage to people developing a strong personal brand that they like, but also delivers for them? A good question. And, and by the way, the way I uh, ended up liking France so much is uh, um, I, I am, um, I consider myself partly Canadian just through marriage. But, you know, so there's some good stuff there. Uh, but, uh, but also I, I love Paris. I love France. I've traveled there and I decided, hey, I've got to make this happen at some point. So, um, but, but I, I think one of the major blockages that we have when we go through and we develop what that roadmap is uh, the thing that keeps us from setting the goal and the, keep it, the thing that keeps us from getting to that roadmap is, is fear, actually. It's, it's mm. just this own apprehension that we have that, you know, as we're doing this, we all get to that point where we say, no, I can't do this. I'm going to, no, never mind. And we end up dropping it. Uh, or or it, it, it creates this lack of motivation in order to do that. So I think fear is probably the biggest thing. You know, we just have to, you know, they call it the big, hairy, audacious goal. And so yep. we've got, you know, that goal that we just think there's no way I'm never, ever going to get here. Yep. Uh, so I did see a question actually in here. How many goals do you need? You know, I think we need um, that big, hairy, audacious goal, but then also broken down into those small wins so that you can have something along the way because otherwise it just seems so unmanageable yeah you know, am i going to be that, that ties into your point about yeah you know, like like you set your goal it's biteable pizza is that you get there yeah yes. nice yeah. one thank you sure okay i'm gonna ask victoria to uh, put a face on and unmute because uh, victoria is going to be our first up today and i'm probably going to be a classic stupid british canadian and totally mispronounce your name um but this is victoria pelletier um who has an amazing career with ibm um she's uh, not uh, f uh, coming from here she's uh, based in the united states she's a senior executive at ibm currently North American talent and transformation leader. So perfectly uh, uh, chosen to be here today, based in New York. She's a sought after speaker, author, uh, passionate diversity and inclusion leader, networking champion, board director, and yes, a fitness fanatic. Um, so boy, she's got lots of personal branding. So Victoria, tell us uh, some thoughts and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Ellen. Um, I'm really happy to be here tonight. So thank you to McLenna and the crew for inviting me. Rick, I'm sure you'd get the last name because I am married to a French Canadian. Uh, and I will say I am a proud Canadian that lives uh, in New York City. So I'm, I'm, you know, embrace my roots very much as part of my brand. Uh, so a, a couple of things, you know, as it relates to brand. So first of all, uh, well, it was interesting. I sort of said to Miglena, I'm like, did you know that I've actually built for IBM our personal branding and eminence training? And they're kind of pimping me out across our organization to deliver the session, even though it's recorded. I do it live quite frequently. 
And a lot of what, you know, Rick was talking about is absolutely resonates with, you know, how I've crafted my own personal brand over the years and the message that I bring, you know, out to, to those I'm talking to, you know, and those are a number of things as we look at sort of that foundation is, you know, the, what are you passionate about? You, in reading out my bio, Alan, a lot of those do describe how I describe my brand. And also, by the way, my network, much like my brand, there is not a distinction, as you were saying, between professional and personal. Mm. The, over, the overlap between the two is incredible. And the fact is, I want to bring my whole self to every interaction that I have. And that means understanding all of the facets of, of who I am. So in crafting that, I'd say it's about what are you passionate about? There is a big element is we're here for business and people do business with people they like, they trust, and they want to do business with. And in my world of IBM, so I'm actually client facing. I'm not an internal talent okay. transformation. I lead the business for North America that consults with clients on how to transform their businesses and their workforces. And so people are doing business with my team because of their brand, how, who they're known for, but also their eminence or what their subject matter expertise is. So as you're building that, make sure you're crisp on what you want to be known for as people buy you as an individual as well. But also really importantly, what makes you different? What is your unique value proposition? You know, and, and certainly what do you want to be known for would be another one. And so as Rick was saying, there's a couple of things, you know, I'm building on that foundation. It's your target audience. What's that story you want to tell? What's your content strategy in terms of how you're going to build that brand and awareness? If you're an entrepreneur, you know, it's very different in terms of places the, and, and who's buying your product or service in terms of where you're marketing to versus from a professional services standpoint. For myself, for example, I, I spend the majority of my time, therefore, on LinkedIn. Twitter is an extension of my LinkedIn medium as an alternative to where some of the articles I publish go, right? So I'm developing that co content strategy, the digital presence and the visibility plan. As Rick said, it's not like set it and forget it. It's constant, like being aware and being, you know, engaging with the network as well. So that would just be one extension as well as we talk about brand is, you know, the networks you build. I also come at it um, from a, there's not two separate networks. You know, I connected with all the hockey parents that I was coaching my daughter's yeah. hockey team before I moved from Toronto to New York. Yeah. Right. I ended up doing business with one of the moms that I ended up meeting with through that environment. So, you know, I'm a quasi open network who go, go wide, go broad. You know, the, in the book, Never Eat Alone, Keith Razzi talks mm -hmm. about you know, generosity, not greed, but being intentional around how you build that and stay connected and stay engaged. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Happy to, to um, respond to any questions uh, after uh, the other speaker's gone. OK, excellent. Thank you. OK, Peter, can you uh, reveal yourself and uh, uh, your, your voice as we introduce you? Um, so Peter Rodriguez uh, is joining us. Um, Peter is the uh, man behind Brand Ignite who wakes up sleepy brands. So I hope none of you are asleep because you're about to get woken up. <laughs> Peter helps people find new growth with frameworks for brand management that he developed over 25 years, running one of the world's top brands in tier one companies. Um, some members of the audience may recall um, his brand uh, me Fra MI framework, which he presented at one of the AMA events last year. So Peter, over to you. Tell us about insights and additions and thoughts. Thank you very much, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me. And thanks to our audience. Um, Rick, thank you for a great presentation. And it's exciting to see your three-step approach, your, th your framework of discover, develop, and deliver. But just as uh, the previous speaker said, um, it is very insightful advice that you are pushing us to focus on the first two, on the discovery and development. This is something I don't think we do enough. And I thank you for making us think that the structure, the foundation of brands is in precisely finding those elements. Then the exterior side will come through a lot better. So that resonated really well with me. Uh, a couple of thoughts that I'd like to offer um, uh, in this great occasion. Um, I think that personal branding, building that is essential, not only for marketers, but for every professional. 
And we sometimes do not pay enough attention to that. It is almost like a blind spot. Uh, but it is the one thing that separates us and makes us stand out in a sea of sameness. And more and more, the more people look alike each other, their resumes look alike each other, there seems to be uh, an amazingly big sea of sameness. So this is incredibly valuable. Um, this is a skill, building a personal brand is a skill that we are never done with. We always um, have the opportunity to improve it. And you said that, Rick, in your presentation, that you take, take the risk, go ahead, make some uh, first attempts at that and make it better. So uh, uh, this is a skill that is crucial because we need to teach people as individuals, as professionals, how to think about ourselves. So if you don't teach others to think how to think about you, they will make up any story about you. And that may not be the best thing for your image. And so I think that you inspire me to think again about taking control, just like a brand manager has control of a brand, you must as a professional have the brand control on your own brand. As I heard you, I also reflected that a personal brand has very similar traits uh, as a commercial brand. So it has to be treated as such. So three things that came to mind. A brand is a promise, it's a shortcut, and it's an asset. And we usually forget that. It is a promise of consistent delivery, consistent experience of you as an individual. It is a shortcut to understand your value. And in this time of very limited attention spans, it becomes critical to be able to say something about you in the first five seconds before you lose people's attention. So it has to be a great shortcut. And more importantly, it has to be treated as an asset because it actually, just like commercial brands, uh, those that are powerful drive better results than the stock market consistently over decades. A personal brand that has power can separate you from, the, um, from everyone else and charge a premium for your work. Just like a brand can do that. You mentioned Starbucks, they charge a premium based on the brand, not on the product. And that made me reflect again, that applies to me, to you or to everyone as a personal brand. The better it is, the better and higher price you can command. So um, I thought that it would be good to think about what great brands do um, to be their value. Uh, and I think I can remember three things, make it relevant to an audience and make sure that you talk to a big need state. Um, define the audience not from a demographic perspective or from a psychographic perspective. That's very important so that it is big and interesting. Um, make your brand distinctive, just like the big brands do. And that is a way to bring your, elevate your attributes into a benefit, a unique benefit. And last but not least, I love the way that you brought up the passion to make it purposeful and let the passion show because that is what makes you like not only say what you do, but why you do it. And that's when people follow a big brand and so many examples that uh, can be mentioned. So net net, I think um, this has given me great things to think about. I, um, I really value and, uh, and thank you for sharing your insight about this. And I do have a question for you. Um, what hurdles have you seen someone can experience as they build their personal brand and how to overcome them? What advice would you have for us, Rick? And thanks everyone. Just before Rick answers, I encourage everybody in the interim to start going to your chat boxes and putting in questions and we'll read out the questions and pass them on. But Rick, you have Peter's question. Thank you very much. Uh, so, th th and thank you. Yeah, good question. What hurdles? Because we, we don't necessarily anticipate when we're dreaming that there are going to be those hurdles. We, we just think that everything's going to go nice and smoothly. And so I think a lot of the hurdles might be um, sometimes it's our own intellect and skill sets, you know, uh, hey, for me, I'm going to admit the French is harder just because it's taking a different portion of my brain that's already filled with other things. And so that can be a hurdle. You know, it might just be if, it, if it's your health or physical ability, if you are um, learning to run a marathon, me, it's not going to happen just because I'm going to end up, you know, wrecking my knees even worse than they already are. Um, you know, so you think about those physical hurdles. It just might be your, your health and your stamina. I mentioned work-life balance. 
I need downtime. So if I get put in, and I was in a job at an advertising agency, and for those of you who have worked in advertising and branding agencies, you know that it's pretty much nonstop. And if you're there until one o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, and if you're in there at six o'clock in the morning, the next morning with two hours sleep, you know, you're in there. And that's, that's a big hurdle for me. I can't get over that. I need the rest time. And so I think that's part of the discovery is going to help to try to eliminate some of those hurdles that if you realize, wait a second, I like my eight hours sleep. I like my time that I get home from class and I can just sit on the sofa and not even watch TV. I can just sit there and think for a couple of minutes and decompress. I need that. And if I don't have that, I'm not going to be successful at what I do. But if you discover that beforehand, as you develop your roadmap, you're going to be able to build that in or at least not make those goals of, of doing something where the hurdles are just going to get in the way. It, it makes it more authentic. So for me to go work for an advertising agency and everything's going to be perfect. No, it's not going to happen. I'm not the right type of person for it. I have a question which I want to put to all three of the speakers, and I'm treading on political grounds here, um, and it's the word trust. Um, and you know, a lot of strong brands, and we've seen going into um, the COVID period for the last six months, brands that have built powerful trust in Victoria, I have to say IBM, absolutely in this. Um, have done better than those that have been a bit, bit flimsy. But let's talk about personal trust and personal branding. Because both sides of the North American border, in fact, all three sides, Canada, US and Mexico, is all having trust issues with its leadership. Um, indeed, if you look around the world, um, we seem to be going through a crisis of political leadership and political branding based on trust, probably the only trusted person around the world is the New Zealand Premier. So how do you, three of you, I'm gonna start with Rick and then go to Victoria and Peter and then invite more questions. How do you put trust into this equation? Because to me, it's such a critical element now. Trust is absolutely a, a, a critical element. You're, you're dead on with that. You know, if, if people, at any point realize that you're being inauthentic or disingenuous, they're gonna lose trust in who you are and what you are. And yes, we've seen that. I won't get into a political discussion at all, but we've we all share it. it. <laughs> we have those experiences. I talked to my brother-in-law and he talks about Canada the same way I talk about the US, yeah. but we won't, we won't share those, but- Same with Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you can sense that inauthenticity. You can sense when someone isn't being genuine. And that's why I really try to emphasize that kind of being who you are. And if you are who you are and you have something to offer, then people are going to trust that you can do that. Victoria, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, authenticity is key. I've actually embraced long before Kim Scott wrote the book, Radical Candor. That's my philosophy, you know, around, you know, being completely open and transparent and sharing the message and the context behind why, but from a place of, of care, quite frankly, you know, so, you know, the, the message for me is to, you know, communicate, communicate, but the, you know, the reason why behind that now is, as you know, if you're a leader in your organization and there's sometimes decisions, um, you know, you can't share all of the context, um, but many times I actually state that as well, quite frankly, yeah. right? Yeah. One and two, actually I've been double hatting the last many months um, for IBM also leading our contact tracing work. So funny, you've got a Canadian talking to all of these US state and local governments um, talking about contact tracing, but it's about recruiting um, you know, and training the right people for this and leading a large operation. And what's interesting is I've been talking to all of these leaders is there's not a lot of trust, you know, and we are all reading stories around what that is. And so then there's a big part of it. And this plays into kind of this systemic racism and the other pieces. And so this goes towards diversity and inclusion as well. So a big part of trust in brands is making sure that the people we're engaging with look sound and are like our, the constituents we serve in the community we live in. And, and to some points we've learned going through COVID, it's not saying to people, I know all the answers. Nobody knows all the answers to COVID and any politician or anybody else who says they do, we, we don't trust because we know it's, it's huge doubt. Peter, um, your views. 
Thank you, Alan. This is a great question. Um, and I think um, my take on trust is that it is a consequence. It's not only something that you can buy or dictate you're going to have trust or say, trust me. The only way that this happens in my view is that, as I said before, a brand is a promise. And that is beautiful. You can make all the promises and sound authentic and be very passionate. However, you have to deliver the goods. And the goods, once that you say, like, if I am going to do something for you, once that you deliver that, then I trust you. And that's what builds a positive energy behind the brand. When brands, big and small, old and new, fail to do that and fail to live up to the reasons to believe, to the product, that's when they fail. And I'm just going to use one example from here in Canada. Tim Hortons, a fantastic brand, fantastic promise for decades deli uh, delivering the promise, gaining the trust. They stopped delivering on the promise on a number of ways, consumers, associates, partners. Then what do you see? They go from one of the top 10 most trusted brands mm -hmm. in Canada to the bottom part of the 50th or 60th. Why? Over like a, such a short amount of time. And I love the brand. I mean, I'm not, this is not, uh, 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 I'm not critiquing, but I'm just showing that trust is a result of delivering the promise. And you have to deliver the promise every day, every interaction, every consumer touch point. If it is a touch point of a blog, a post, a phone call, an email, a personal com, uh, call, the brand, the personal brand has to deliver what you promised. When that doesn't happen, trust breaks and it's lost before you know it. So that would be my answer. But I think it's a great question, Alan. I think it's trust is everything and it takes time to build and it takes one second to lose. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to go one question that's come up on the chat box, but then after that, I'm going to ask Max and Meglina because part of the plan was maybe to go into breakout groups or whether we keep going with this. So I'll, I'll leave it to the organizers to let us know what they want to do. But here is the question being asked by several people. How do you get an honest assessment of your current personal brand being projected? In other words, get through that everybody wants to be polite to you. And I'll start with Rick and again, go on to Victoria and Peter. Uh, you know, if, if you've got a close circle of friends, if you've got those people, it could be a husband, a wife, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a, you know, a trusted boss, um, someone that, who you volunteer with, who you can really trust. I mean, uh, they're going to tell you. The, the honest thing. I mean, I get a lot of advice from, from people who, who are brutally honest with me and I, I want that and I appreciate that. And so letting them know, you know, that you want something and want the honest perception. So you, you go out, um, you kind of see what they think of that. And by you trusting them, they're going to know that they can say something and you're not going to end up, you know, hating each other just because of it. That's kind of, that's kind of the short answer. You know, when you think about the personal brand, we could, uh, I could get into that deeper, but let's go ahead and have the others talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing for going to Victoria, you can prompt it. You know, honestly, I don't think I'm that good at it. Am I, you know, so you give people a permission to be honest, but Victoria, what do you think? Yeah, so, I, I agree that you need to ask for others who are going to give you an honest opinion, the radical candor. Um, <clears throat> but I'd also encourage you to ask people who understand what your goals, your objectives are, understand branding and marketing in asking that question, right? So your your, your best friend who's, you know, the uh, finance director may or may not be that person who's going to be able to critically you know, critique your, your brand. I mean, I think they'll give you elements of it from a complete outsider, but again, is that your target audience? Hmm. Are you like Peter out there invigorating brands and coaching people? And so if you don't have someone immediately in your circle, seek, seek them out. I mean, in all of, all else pales or, uh, fails, there's certainly enough people who you can pay to help you with that also. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that you need honest feedback. Uh, and I think one of the ways that I um, have received honest feedback is by asking mindful questions. So um, give them a little bit, a specific area to comment on. I mean, 
uh, how my uh, behavior, how my uh, expression of my brand affected you in a positive or negative way in a specific time, and then tell me more about it. So by building that, I think that uh, it becomes a very insightful conversation. The other thing that I have also done, and I don't know, um, uh, it's a little risky, but it's interesting. It's I have asked feedback from people who don't like me. Mm. And I, I'd like to understand why they don't like me. And it has been incredibly <laughs> insightful. Yeah. And it has been revealing of blind spots that I didn't know before. Yeah. And that probably my close friends would forgive or condone because they're in a very close space. But uh, that has also been um, interesting. It is risky, but it is, it is part of the exercise. I, I think that that's a very, very good question. So back to my question with Max and Miglena, how, how would you like to handle the next little while? Keep going this session or do breakouts? I think we can continue the conversation in our breakout session. It feels like there are a lot of topics going on in the chat room and I'm Great. sure people, people will, won't mind to, to meet a few people in this, uh, in this session. So thank you very much, Rick, Alan, Victoria, and Peter for this fantastic session. A lot of insights a lot of great um, ideas that we will definitely be able to apply in our everyday life. Uh, now is the uh, time for the break, breakout sessions. To help you drive the conversation in each small group, we prepared a discussion topic with you for you, but actually it feels like there are so many questions in the chat that we, you can just pick any of the questions uh, you, you have there. And uh, Rick generously agreed to stay with us for the breakout session. So some of you will be lucky enough to continue asking him questions. Uh, same with Peter, same with uh, Victoria and Alan. Uh, so I'm asking Marina to, to break the group into uh, 